Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to uh, this uh, webinar series organized by the Program on Democracy and the Internet at Stanford's uh, Cyber Policy Center, and also organized by the Hewlett Foundation Cyber Initiative, uh, which offers this weekly series where we discuss tech policy uh, and, uh, and, and, other, and, and international relations and a num number of other issues. And um, I'm Julia Wono, the executive director of the Content Policy and Society Lab, by um, launched at the Program on Democracy and the Internet. And uh, I am extremely happy today to uh, to welcome uh, Erika Shimizu Banks, with whom we will discuss a very interesting title: "Inclusive Content Moderation is Innovative Content Moderation." And we look forward to diving uh, into uh, into that with Erika. But before doing that, I think Erika, it's it would be great, you know, your brilliant path and your experience. So I'll just go ahead and and tell the audience about your your bio. So you're a tech policy expert, an inclusion innovator, and you're also the founder of Shizo, a uh, consultancy that applies an international intersectional equity lens to business development, tech, and policy challenges. And you, you, you did that specifically after experiencing triumphs and trials of technology uh, by building successful DEI programs at Google, for instance, and then holding Pinterest accountable for its racism and sexism. I'd love to talk about that. I hope we'll have some words on that during the presentation. And sorry, my light just went off. Um, and now you, you create systems and frameworks to, uh, to elevate and restore equity in our institutions uh, and, 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 our, and our companies. So you were named one of the 2021 Route 100 and uh, a 2018 Forbes, Forbes 30 under social entrepreneurs, and also a 2017 Washingtonian Magazine Tech Titan. And your career is uh, absolutely a testament to the values and, uh, and that you leave personally and, and professionally. I'm really happy to, uh, to, to know you as well. And uh, again, to have this, uh, this conversation today about uh, some of the frameworks that you've been working on. So without further ado, Erica, I, uh, we go directly into it and I will, yeah, let you, let you take over for 30 minutes. We'll have a, a presentation by you, a detailed presentation of the frameworks you've worked on. And then afterwards, I'll have some questions that I uh, that I will ask you before letting the audience. I mean, I mean, reading audience questions as well. So, welcome, Erica, and please go ahead. Thank you so much, Julie. It's such an honor to be in conversation with you, and thank you to Stanford Cyber Policy Center for having me, and the Hewlett Packard Foundation for supporting initiatives like this. And thank you to all of you who joined in the middle of your day uh, for this conversation. Um, and I really want it to be, even in the section where I'm just presenting, um, at least intellectually interactive. And I'll get into that a little bit more about what I mean. But um, you know, for so many tech companies uh, and for so many um, platforms and startups, the beginning of the idea becomes real when it's built through collaboration. And um, in that same vein, um, when challenges arise, solutions to problems must also be collaborative and become collaborative. And I think we have a space here and a real opportunity to not see um, not see the challenges as just problems to solve. Um, while there's definitely uh, necessary criticism and criticism and critique, um, there's also a lot of space for imagination and opportunity. So um, that is how I see innovation, and that is how I see this topic. So. I will start sharing my screen and we'll get into it. So to me, this presentation is really about, and I hope what comes forth for you is how this presentation is about hope and imagination with all of the challenges we're facing, not just online, but in real life with the continuation of the pandemic, um, uncertainty going into the midterm elections and uh, the state of things generally. Um, there is a lot to be critical of, there is a lot to question, and yet at the same time, there's a lot to be hopeful for, and there is a lot to imagine 
for ourselves and what the future can look like. And I really see this as a framework for addressing problems, for addressing solutions, um, for starting at the beginning, be it with my clients or partners in the civil rights space and the nonprofit space of how do we build with equity by design and particularly an intersectional equity lens. And so for me, frameworks and systems start with imagination. And I was interest, I was introduced really uh, to this concept, you know, as we all were as children, but after decades of sort of putting that behind for the, the rigors and complexities of adulthood, um, this engagement with the imagination was reignited in me through a conference I got to take part of in 2019 at the Arena Stage Theater in DC, where I'm based. And one of the main topics of conversation for this entire group of folks who were in tech, who were in policy, the arts, politics, um, was this, what if we built for utopias instead of dystopias? And that question blew my mind um, because I don't think I recognized how so much of what we build for, what we um, envision for the future, what we put out in the culture is based on this concept of dystopia. And what would it look like to really build a utopia, one that was just peaceful, inclusive, um, based in equity. And so that is the framework that um, I build my work from and approach this topic. And I feel very affirmed in this and that Albert Einstein seemed to approach it the same way. Uh, he has this beautiful quote from his book, Cosmic Religion and Other Opinions and Aphorisms. Imagination is more important than knowledge for knowledge is limited, whereas imagination embraces the world, stimulating progress, giving birth to evolution. It is strictly speaking a real factor in scientific research. So with that framing, I'd like to introduce the curb cut effect and how that could inform content moderation and real innovation in this space. So the curb cut effect grew out of a political act enacted on the UC Berkeley campus in the 1970s in that disability rights advocates broke open a piece of sidewalk and put in a curb. Now, this was not the first curb that was ever placed in a sidewalk, but it ignited a political conversation that then reformed the limited existing legislation on um, disability access rights, um, the Architectural Accessibility um, Bill of 1968. And a surprising result of this was that the US did not just become more accessible for, um, for disabled people in that that bill only approached buildings and did not approach, uh, did not address the street, did not address the sidewalk to get into the building. Um, once they looked beyond that and evolved to include uh, those protections, they found that life got easier in terms of getting around for not only disabled folks, but everyone. Parents wheeling their children in strollers, elderly people using canes, um, you know, or just having to walk slowly down a street, um, children, uh, all sorts of people, pretty much everyone has benefited from that political act of inserting a curb cut at, um, at UC uh, Berkeley's campus. And so from that, the curb cut effect as a name was born. And Angela Glover Blackwell, uh, founder of uh, Policy Link, um, really dove into this topic and explained its implications, not just for accessibility uh, policies, but really beyond for all society. And um, her most recent iteration of this discussion has been on if we approached if we approached the COVID pandemic with this in mind, what would the future look like for us? And so the principle of the curb cut effect is this. When we create the circumstances that allow those who have been left behind to participate and contribute fully, everyone wins. The corollary is also true. When we ignore the challenges faced by the most vulnerable, those challenges magnified many times over become a drag on so many things. <clears throat> so this is what the curb cut effect looks like in action um, and through the example of um, public transportation. We can see when we have public transportation, which was perhaps um, first enacted to serve the most financially vulnerable among us, the low income, we find that everyone benefits. So how do we take this concept of the curb cut effect and create a framework out of it for content moderation? Focusing on this first piece, we must create the circumstances 
that allow those who have been left behind to participate and contribute fully so that everyone can win. Oops. Apologies, let me get back to this. Okay, I think that works. Yes. Um, the secondary piece, unfortunately, seems to be how a lot of technology has evolved, content moderation and, and actions of social platforms generally for the, our most vulnerable communities um, with ramifications for all of us and all of society when we ignore the challenges. So I posit this framing uh, specific for content moderation. When we ignore the challenges identified by the most vulnerable among us, those challenges managed many times over become a drag on innovation. And how many of us know this to be true, who perhaps work in tech or study these issues? I've listed some challenges in content moderation here. Disinformation, misinformation, hate speech, harassment, grooming, doxing, some, et cetera. These are sort of the topical challenges that we're facing. Um, and then there are the technical challenges um, that have often been used by companies to uh, mitigate their, their addressing of these, these topical challenges, right? Subjectivity of review, uh, what, what constitutes hate speech, et cetera and then scale, right? Um, if the example is always given, if Facebook were to remove even 1% um, of content that's uploaded every few seconds, that's millions of pieces of content, right? Um, so let's take disinformation as a case study of applying this framework of imagination of the curb cut effect. And let's explore one example. Um, so, you know, when we look at the issues, uh, important to this framing is not just solutions, but right imagination, looking beyond this binary. Um, but it also has to be said, as many folks have seen in their experience, I'm sure working on these issues, that there is a lot more research and attention paid to the issues and challenges versus the solutions. As you can see here, um, by a significant factor, there are so many more articles, um, so many more academic papers about challenges versus um, solutions. So if we go back to 2014, um, before the Trump administration, before the lead up to that, the disinformation campaigns launched by Russia and Iran, uh, before the uh, common understanding of troll farms and, and um, things like that, black women were identifying that something was not right online. Um, some of you may be familiar with the 2014 hashtag end Father's Day hoax, but Rochelle Hampton at Slate um, dives into it here. So before Gamergate, before the 26th election, there was a campaign of Twitter trolls masquerading as women of color online. And it started on Father's Day, where um, basically there were tweets coming out, getting engagement about how... Uh, Father's Day should be ended specifically for black, black men because they have not shown up for black women. And two black women in particular, Laneja Crockett and Shafika Hudson identified something was not right in the way these tweets were worded, um, in the way that the accounts who were sending out these tweets uh, seemed to have strange uh, profile photos, um, did not have many followers, did not follow many accounts. And these were usually some of their first tweets. And um, despite that odd pattern of behavior, it didn't seem at the time that the platform of Twitter was recognizing that. So they sounded the alarm. And um, when we think about, you know, we've heard a lot about um, how this happens, right? And consistently, people from marginalized groups, especially in terms of our politics, um, content moderation issues, Black women have been at the fore of calling out these patterns, calling flagging these issues um, to very little avail, as we know these issues are still facing us today. Where might this come from? Well, we know that black women are the most abused online. A 2018 Amnesty International report showed that black women were 84% more likely than white women to be disproportionately targeted. One in 10 tweets mentioned black women in an abusive or problematic way, and compared to one in 15 for white women, women of color were 34% more likely to be targeted. So while this is a state of discrimination and there's a lack of safety for black women on the platform, 
the familiar familiarity with that in some ways has made us the best in line to identify these problems and identify these problematic trends as they begin. And yet we're still not heard. But what would happen if we had this framework of let's speak to the most impacted by harm, the most vulnerable from the start, from the design, from the product build stage to implementation. Um, it was too late in terms of the rise of the alt-right, troll farms, et cetera. Um, and it was ignored to what effect. Now this report was commissioned by the State Department called Weapons of Mass Distraction, getting into um, the campaigns by Russia and Iran on disinformation. And the quotes I've pulled here show uh, a few things. What is one reason why Black women may have been ignored? Well, because there are not the incentives to limit this kind of disinformation. Um, and we saw that come, we saw that come out in all sorts of, we see this pattern in all sorts of disinformation campaigns, whether it is um, about uh, disrupting an election, whether it is about spreading COVID, uh, falsehoods, similar patterns. And the end Father's Day hoax, for example, targeting uh, Black people, Black Americans, was actually, uh, it turned out to be a part of Russian disinformation campaigns. Um, so why did why were social media platforms slow to uh, respond? Because the incentives were not there. The incentives are not in the technology to do that. You can read that here. However, it should be an incentive to moderate content, not just because of public outcries, not just because of calls of racism, bias, et cetera, um, but also because the evidence shows that long-term, this is a threat to social media companies. Um, and there are ways to mitigate these issues, which is the last paragraph here. So let's take a case study of how to, if we had our chance to start from the beginning and prevent disinformation, I'm sure there are actually many solutions. But one I'd like to propose based on what I've learned from reading from a lot of disability rights advocates and working with civil rights groups comes down to access, comes down to a possible solution in alt text. And again, this is for imagination purposes. Um, so please uh, engage in the exercise with me. So um, the history of web accessibility is as old as the web. And yet research shows that social media platforms are becoming more inaccessible, not less. According to Web AIM, Web Accessibility in Mind at the Institute for Disability Research Policy and Practice at Utah State University, alt text, which is a textual substitute for non-text contact in web pages, um, which is usually focused on images, but also applies to um, multimedia and other non-text contact, uh, is available, but usually on a voluntary basis. And there is very low uptake, despite it being available since 2016 on most social media platforms. In fact, as early as 1996, the White House issued guidance on web accessibility, including alt text. Then the UN commissioned a global audit of 100 leading websites and found that the majority of those websites did not meet international standards for web accessibility, including alt text. In 2006, the National Federation of the Blind filed a class action lawsuit against Target because of the lack of accessibility on its website. Um, in terms of my relation to, to this, one of my jobs in college was actually to scan books and make their, uh, the digital copies um, legible through alt text um, and digitally legible for uh, readers, screen readers. So going back to this point that the, the research shows social media platforms are becoming more inaccessible, not less. Um, although some platform features such as these voluntary measures of including alt text, um, have been in effect since 2016 and more widely in 2018. Um, the majority uh, high traffic websites only have alternative text on perhaps 40% of images, um, as most at 70%. And findings show that over time, especially as platforms become more um, adjusted and, and rely more, and users upload more content that is multimedia the uptake of alt text is decreasing and the media available on um, social media um, platforms is increasingly inaccessible to those who are visually impaired and others who would benefit from alt text. But what would happen if alt text was the default feature for multimedia uploads? 
well, initial solutions. Um, it would have an ex it would be very impactful in terms of access for the visually impaired, increased access, ease of access in terms of using platforms, and in terms of the impact for the companies and industry, it would result in an increase in users. Um, many, uh, there was a study done in which uh, blind users of Twitter and um, Instagram and other platforms were asked uh, about their levels of engagement. And many replied, well, 80% responded that their use of a platform is determined by, in some case, or related to their blindness. Um, and many of them noted, even without the research, that these platforms were becoming less and less accessible to them. So these platforms are losing um, a key uh, constituency of users. Beyond the accessibility benefits, alt text has been key to enhanced search engine optimization for, for advertisers, retailers, et cetera. So there would be benefits overall. In terms, of, um, in terms of disinformation, we know that troll farms disinformation campaigns uh, thrive from virality and they thrive from speed, inter speed and scale. If there was an automatic prompt, for example, for a manual alt text or an automatic alt text translation of, um, of images uploaded, one, it would break up that speed and repetition, and two, it would call for a necessity for increased quality of evaluation of alt text and how images are generally described and listed online, and would probably then flag better filtration, um, filtration automatic, automated filtration options. This would then feed into how data sets are informed. It would force um, an increase in the quality of descriptions and provide better uses and more far reaching uses perhaps for content moderation. And after my section, of course, I'd love to hear what other folks think of this idea. Now, I. Did I, you know, I might have come up with this in the sense that um, I remember looking over uh, policies and responses uh, related to the disinformation campaigns that, uh, that started in 2016, 2017. And uh, one reason for the slow recognition from platforms about the spread of, of these misinformation, disinformation tools is that um, there was a lack of tooling for reading images. And while this may have changed quite a bit since 2016, um, especially because some of the images used, um, some might remember the Heart of Texas campaign, for example, or the uh, co-option of feminist images, for example, um, was the lack of relation between the image to, uh, to the topic discreetly, right, of politics, of, of, of wanting to sow discord and disinformation. Um, however, if, I think, if there were tools earlier that looked to merge accurate, high quality descriptions of images with, um, with the images or the multimedia content themselves, this might've been a problem um, that we could have addressed um, a lot earlier and, and perhaps prevented at some level of scale. Again, um, just for imagination's purposes. But, you know, I'm not the only person that had this idea, has thought of this. Um, most recently, I noticed this paper uh, by these authors here, catching out of context, context misinformation with self-supervised learning. So um, here's an overview of, of that paper and their results there. But um, what they found is that uh, they proposed a self-supervised training strategy where they only needed a set of captioned images. And what they tested was to see if both captions correspond to the same objects in the image but were semantically different. So addressing that disconnect that tripped so many of us up back in 2016, right? And their method to do this achieved 85% of out of context detection accuracy. Now, there are absolutely um, other folks who have thought of this. There are other, you know, perhaps companies as well that are already putting some of these uh, tools into effect, highlighting another um, paper here. This one dates back to 2016 about how captions could be leveraged in the wild to improve object detection. Um, and then uh, another tool um, by these folks at UC Berkeley on how to, uh, how to um, evaluate images via Im the Imgur website um, through the use of a new public data set called Social Vision and Language Dataset, SVLD. So this is not an original idea, 
But when I did a search, there weren't that many papers on the topic. And I can only imagine, you know, I use alt text as an example, but I can only imagine that there are so many other unexplored accessibility features that disability, that disability advocates have been asking for, uh, for use en masse um, that have gone unexplored that could have perhaps had these proactive preventative features um, that, that could have been useful back in 2016. But you know, the, the upside to that is they will still be useful today. And of course, within that, we have to watch out for the ways in which bias and harm can still be perpetuated. Um, but again, when we look at these issues, um, not as just problems to be solved and take that reactive stance, but take that proactive, imaginative stance of how do we build from the beginning? How do we build with the challenges that our most vulnerable will face at the onset? Then perhaps going down the pipeline to development and deployment, um, we would come up with solutions and safeguards to prevent situations like, like we have now where we're in the process of cleaning up data sets and cleaning up the misogyny, pornography, and malignant stereotypes that we see perpetuated, not just in content, but in how they are described, um, in file names and metadata, et cetera, um, and instead could start with, quote unquote, cleaner, um, more representative, more equitable representation in data sets going forward. And these challenges are identified by the folks here. So there is a tactical kind of idea here, right, of like exploring the idea. What if we approach content moderation from the lens of um, the accessibility feature of, of alt text? Well, deeper than the technical application of that, we also need to shift cultural perspectives and practices. And um, one framing that I think is key to this is seeing um, is shifting from a perspective of bias to harm. Now, what would happen if we use the language and analysis of harm instead of bias? And Julie and I will get into that in our conversation a little bit, but um, that framing and analysis of harm um, instead of bias is also a, a sort of a first step in lieu of building backwards, right? We can't go back in moving forward how do we implement this curb cut framework of imagination? How do we ground that? Um, and how do we start from now? We have to assess what has been done. And I share a little bit of, uh, of one source that I look to for that, that shift in framing. Um, <clears throat> and that gets into the uh, beyond the statement tech framework that I had the opportunity to work with, with Color of Change. Um, now, Julie, we don't worry, we will get to this in the Q&A, uh, but in the interest of time, I really want to highlight this project. Um, so many folks may see the bills that are coming out now, not just in the U.S., but the EU, taking the approach of tech regulation or a first step towards tech regulation, let's say, through assessment. And there have been a lot of discussions about why that is not enough, why that might be problematic in and of itself. Um, and I acknowledge those challenges, but I do think it's a first step to assess where we are so we can get to a place where we build with design, build equity by design and build with that imagination curb cut effect framework. And so I was honored to work with Color of Change on um, this imagining process of how do we do this analysis and figure out where we are and where tech companies are. And this resulted in Beyond the Statement. Um, color of change's approach here and perspective here is that tech firms must proactively take steps to preserve and enhance the civil rights of their users. And if it's not a retrospective, um, if it's not a proactive step, it needs to be retrospective in analyzing for, the, uh, analyzing for these things. Increasing transparency, evaluating products for discrimination, recruiting, hiring, and supporting a diverse workforce, hiring and empowering internal civil rights staff, and holding internal decision makers accountable. And finally, divesting from police and mass incarceration. So what does that look like? Increased transparency in the form of opening up the hood on these processes, on these policies, how they are formed, how these products are developed and implemented. Um, audits would provide the general public with this knowledge of where a company stands regarding the diversity of its staff um, and would help make staff and the public aware of perhaps discriminatory product features. Um, transparency is key to this work. 
um, because without an honest assessment of where a company is in terms of its products, in terms of its policies, in terms of its practices in real life, we cannot really call for change. We cannot call for legislation if we don't know, um, you know what to change and what to legislate. So this is a key first step. The second piece, evaluating products for discrimination is pretty straightforward. But um, for color of change specifically, this is with uh, the experience of black users at its core in testing for the discriminatory impact and threat to civil rights. And so assessments within an audit should be um, geared towards um, ensuring products developed will be created with intentionality and with thoughtful experience given to the experience of black users. And I would say again, to the curb cut effect, to the most vulnerable populations among us. The third piece of this, recruit, hire, and support a diverse workforce. Um, behind every product, behind every process, is a person. And who we are as people inform um, the practices and policies of a company. We see that to be true in, in learning about the, the lack of quality in data sets, for example, um, in training data that was informed by homogenous groups of people with perhaps you know, a more homogenous point of view. Um, so, so that's one end of the input right into a product and in terms of the staff behind it. The second piece of that is that particularly for content moderation, workers who are essential to that core function of many platforms do not have the full rights of employees. And so as not just um, a tool for uh, retention, as a tool for morale, but really as a tool for investment and safety, um, our tech framework um, really encourages and requires that workers who are essential to business fun functions be treated as employees. Fourth, it's not enough to have just a diverse and representative staff. That staff must also include civil rights, um, civil rights experts, so that they can review these technologies for adverse impacts to not just black, but all minority and, and, and um, marginalized users. And they must have the power to uh, decision, they must have the decision-making power to either stop certain processes from happening um, and even, even stop certain products from, from shipping. Um, because we see the impact, right? And again, as that corollary states, while when we don't address the challenges that the most vulnerable identify, this is a lag on innovation, this is a lag on society. So that civil rights perspective is key. And finally, when challenges are identified, it's not enough to talk about the subjectivity or the scale. There has to be accountability for why these changes are not happening. And um, what does accountability look like? That's protocol, um, but that's real measures of consequence uh, within staffing in an organization. And finally, uh, very key to color of changes work and very key to the type of technology um, that is informed especially by um, algorithmic methods or automated methods is uh, surveillance technology and tools that um, decide prison sentences, that decide whether someone is eligible for parole or not and they're based on a lot of biased and harmful inputs. And so um, in order to really build with equity by design, build for this curb cut effect, uh, we have to analyze how a company is engaging with law enforcement, mass incarceration police, and where they can do best. Um, I'm getting a little over time here, so I'll conclude with this uh, quote again from Albert Einstein as my bookend, you can't solve a problem with the same mind that created it. Now, um, there are many, there are many standard setting organizations that have come up very recently, and I applaud their existence on content moderation and trust in public safety, the Trust and Safety Professionals Association, who have also set up standards and released papers about how to do this thoughtfully, the Digital Trust and Safety Partnership, which is the consortium of companies um, who, who, you know, do address some of these issues, but um, I'm sure for a lot of corporate considerations have, you know, had to sort of minimize at least some assessment of, of impact on marginalized communities and real um, and real tactical suggestions on that, but still appreciate the companies are, are taking a look and forming associations around this. And then the OASIS Consortium. Um, and, uh, and, you know, they have set the first standards for the metaverse, which Julie and I will be discussing. Um, and, you know, it's just the beginning. So, 
we have the chance to take a look at these standards, take a look at these first steps and, and correct and really build for that curb cut effect. So um, with that, I will bring Julie back on. Thank you so much for your time and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Erica. First of all, I was off camera and fortunately because I was tearing all the time at every single of your sentences. Um, this was extremely illuminating and, uh, and I look forward to diving into uh, the, 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 well, some of the questions that I, that I had, that we have prepared and that I have prepared also while listening to you. Uh, first of all, I wanted to also mention that, you know, not less letting the challenges drag Uh, until they become problems is exactly at the core of the CPSL content policy lab. And we use the multi-stakeholder approach to foster that, well, to start a first step in, in, in fostering that inclusivity. Uh, but I, let's focus a bit on the um, beyond the statement framework. We've seen that the, one of the first um, standards is to uh, be more transparent, asking companies to be more transparent, including opening up The, the, that black box around uh, data and around uh, the, how the decisions are norms. So I, I was just wondering if you could speak to the, well, detail a little bit that demand and specifically speak to the demands of uh, data access, for instance, uh, where are we in the United States on this discussion? Because it's one, st it's one thing to build a framework and hopefully uh, have it implemented. So wanted to know where we are on the policy front. On that. There we go. Absolutely. So um, on that front, in terms of, you know, auditing work, it's a, it's a relatively new field when it comes to tech. So the history of equity audits actually start with the, um, the uh, Brown versus Board of Education um, decisions and actually five decisions related to integration of public schools in the U.S. in the 1950s. And so the Department of Education started the first of what could be called equity audits then, and they focused on integration. So there was a clear civil rights um, lens to this analysis from the beginning. It expanded to environmental and social governance um, and when uh, through, you know, the rise of activist stakeholders and also recognition of, of you know, um, need for sustainability considerations and human rights considerations in, in corporate practices. Um, so with this tech framework, we build on that history and we build on, you know, that legacy of putting civil rights and labor first to, to analyze these issues. And, you know, while tech is so differentiated in, in many ways, it is an industry like any other and deserves to be analyzed from those same viewpoints in terms of civil rights and labor. Um, but it is also, you know, it's not a perfect step to do an audit. There are so many pieces that, um, that, are, that, that are subject to what the company allows, um, what the auditor asks for. And so I suggest that folks take a look at this beyond the statement framework alongside um, a recent article published by Laura Murphy, a recent paper published by Laura Murphy um, in partnership with the Ford's Foundation on, on how to implement a civil rights audit. And um, transparency for both of us, uh, myself and Laura, is at, is at the core. Because again, you cannot tell where you are unless you have an honest assessment of, of what that, of of where you are. And that is informed by documentation, that is informed by conversation, that is uh, informed by filings and all sorts of things. And so beyond um, one way to, to guarantee or at least increase opportunity for this transparency is through legislation. And so there are several bills that are actually, um, you know, before the, le before the federal legislature, before Congress, and also at the local level that are addressing this. And so I'll start with the local level. And I think the most uh, impactful perhaps of these bills, um, at least from what a lot of my uh, partners in the civil rights space are saying is the uh, DC uh, legislation to stop discrimination in, automatic, in automated decision-making tools. And the Stop Discrimination by Algorithms Act, which would be instituted in the District of Columbia, would prohibit companies and organizations from using algorithms that produce biased and unfair results. It would require companies to audit their algorithms for discriminatory patterns. And then key to this, again, so important, 
increased transparency for consumers. Consumers, so companies would be required to make easy understand easy easy to understand disclosures to all consumers about their use of algorithms to reach decisions, what personal information they collect, and how their algorithms use it to reach decisions. And several um, civil rights groups, even beyond just with the purview of DC, have given their endorsement of this, including Color of Change. And so, um, I think this this is a great example of the impact you can have even for a very uh, hyper-local bill. Um, now, of course, zooming out into the needs of the entire nation and the different constituencies who and stakeholders there, um, we have the Algorithmic Accountability Act. And I want to make an important distinction here in that this bill is targeted at critical life decisions like healthcare, housing, education, and not particularly social media. This bill was first introduced in 2019, and it is up for reintroduction, I believe, as early as next week. And I was honored to be able to contribute to this um, and offer, also offer my endorsement of this, um, working with uh, Senator Wyden's staff in particular. And what this bill does, it expands and refines definitions and requirements related to algorithmic accountability, what these assessments would be, shifting them from more voluntary assessments to required reporting. Um, and while, like I said, it's focused in these critical life decision areas, um, there are many transferable points um, that could impact content moderation and especially um, ad targeting and, um, and, and, and ad tech. And uh, a really cool feature of this bill, but a very, you know, a, one that really needs to be discussed fully is that they propose in this bill to um, expand a department, create a new department, the Bureau of Technology within the FTC to address uh, resource needs in evaluating these audits and just evaluating concerns um, and, and valid criticisms that tech companies have had for a while in terms of um, you know, the awareness level of, legis of legislators and their staff as to these technical issues that they would have to regulate. And you know, even in my time working at Google and, and uh, Pinterest, you know, that, that piece was, was clear and that there was a bit of a gap in terms of understanding. And so resourcing, um, and, and this is not to say that there are not tech policy experts on the Hill at all, but um, as we've seen from hearings and the like, um, the government could needs, desperately needs increased resourcing to keep up with the various issues and expansions and products in the tech space so that they can adequately and accurately um, review them and then and then then create rulemaking and legislate on them. Um, and you know, so I'll, I'll leave it at that for those two bills specific to auditing, but there are a lot in the digital space, as we know, um, in digital services that are on the table right now. Thank you very much. Uh, um... Erika, before I get to my next question, I would like to remind the audience that we will be taking questions uh, in, in a few minutes from now. So please, please feel free to submit any questions you have. We already have uh, a few. My next uh, focus is, okay, there is some legislative agitation at the very least, uh, if not some successful adoptions. Uh, and you mentioned digital services. It immediately made me think of the Digital Services Act in the European Union, which will seriously impact uh, content platforms. Uh, but a little bit of provocation. So beyond responding to those uh, threats of regulation, um, what is actually uh, be beyond evading regulation? Is there, is there really a market exp um, sorry, incentive for, for companies to invest that much? Because it's, it's, it's a lot of investment. Um, so to invest that much in inclusivity, in thinking by design, the problems before they even happen, and even including those that could be uh, uh, affected, but, but in meaningfully including them. Well, I would say absolutely so, because I think um, if you look at, well, first, it has already been identified that beyond content moderation, just in the operation and uh, deployment of products in the tech space, diversity is uh, increases the bottom line. Diversity is incredibly beneficial. And so inclusivity, which is very much tied to that, um, 
would have a similar effect. And when companies include diverse perspectives, when they include um, and really include like this curb cut effect asks the needs of the most marginalized, these have ripple effects and not just for the marginalized populations, but for users as a whole. Um, it would create a better experience. Um, beyond that, you know, research shows that uh, diversity of viewpoints and inputs is key actually to fighting misinformation, disinformation, and as is, uh, you know, with respect to the case studies I brought up um, in that, you know, it's one of the few things that gets through to people about misinformation, how to turn away from those campaigns. So uh, that one size fit all approach or that homogenous perspective is, is not cutting, getting through. Um, furthermore, you know, there, if we were to build proactively, I think, you know, a lot of companies spend a lot of money on, of pre-filtering tools that are not informed with um, unbiased data sets or inclusive data sets that are not informed uh, by a diverse set of stakeholders. Um, these technologies are faulty. And so that results in increased costs in terms of lawsuits, in terms of um, creating tooling to clean up right, uh, the existing violations of terms of service, et cetera, on the platform. And so I think it's really just about shifting perspective and that proactive response, I think, as it is in medicine, works as it, as it will in tech, that an ounce of prevention is, is better than a pound of cure. I couldn't agree more. Uh, my last question, and hopefully we can keep it short to allow for uh, Ojin's question. So now working with entrepreneurs, with startups, uh, applying the, the, this particular framework that you've just presented, uh, the beyond the statement. So what would you say are currently the top three recommendations that out of all these recommendations from the framework, what are the top three that you think companies want to prioritize to do, to do better, uh, especially when you're a startup and when you, yeah, you want to start by design being, having these information. I think uh, one at the top is always going to be transparency and transparency is not just on the back end of when you're doing an, an audit, you know, uh, popping open the hood, sharing your documents, etc. It's also about making your policies and your processes transparent to your users from the beginning, clear and concise terms of service, clear and concise terms about use of information, uses of information, privacy, access. These are key and they, these build trust from the beginning with your user. And this is something I'm seeing in some of my, in the startups that I advise, for example, one example is Lita, which is a startup looking to create sort of closed, um, closed community uh, social uh, media for uh, students. And their, um, you know, their, mo their motto is uh, putting the user first through privacy and through responsible tech and, and that we should get to trusting tech. And so um, how do we build that trust? Transparency is key. Um, second, you know, I do think it is about content moderation in many ways. It's the, the topic of consideration in the news. So often it's um, a user's experience with most platforms is through the content shared on those platforms. And so um, analysis and auditing there is, is, is um, well, analysis and auditing and being proactive again of using this sort of curb cut mentality to create content moderation policies is key. Um, and, you know, uh, some features that I include when I suggest a content moderation assessment um, are a couple KPIs. And um, those KPIs are, are your, are, is your resourcing proportional to the reported content? Because I'd argue that actually um, for most companies, it's not. But, it, but those companies could afford for it to be, if we think about the companies that have the most content out there, YouTube, Facebook, you know, our top five companies, they can afford the resourcing to make it proportionate. Second, um, when comparing your existing content to violating content detected and reported um, over time, are you noticing changes? Are you noticing patterns? And third, What's the turnover like of your content moderation team or contractors? And that brings me to the third priority, which I think, you know, alongside this, there has been so much labor organizing, not just in tech, but in, across so many industries. As we're going into the year three of the pandemic, folks are really burned out, right? Um, there's the risk of getting ill on the job all the time, and folks are becoming really aware of their rights. And, um, and this is really to the benefit of us all to create a more sustainable workforce. And we need to address these um, issues. And, and one way to do that is by um, making these, these labor considerations key. Um, to, as well. So again, 
the, so number three to that would be looking at your workforce, making sure that they're empowered, making sure that if they're performing essential business functions, um, that they are treated like full-time employees and have the benefits and resourcing uh, for that. Um, and if I could add a fourth, it's kind of like an umbrella across all of these things. Um, we have to have a lens of human and civil rights because ultimately all users are people. These products are made by people um, and it affects us all in society. Thank you very much, uh, Erica. I'll go straight to the questions. Uh, uh, we've, we've got three out there. I'll read them all and then you can respond because we have a little less than 10 minutes. So question from, and I will name them because they, I think they, they put their names, uh, Ray Jereza watching alongside with Chris Gray. So they're asking, how do you envision inclusion for third-party commercial content moderators in ways that take seriously their expertise and professionals who are encountering harmful content? And what are your ideas about supporting moderators of colors or moderators who are immigrants? Second question, Given the, the need for expertise in auditing, what do you think of the idea that agency should an agency get involved with specific moderation incidents? And third question, uh, there is a tension between wanting transparency, uh, algorithms, platform practices, et cetera, and also wanting privacy and no tracking, race, gender, personal health issues. Is there a way to reconcile? So I'll stop there for now. Absolutely. These are excellent questions. And, you know, I'm just one person with some ideas. Um, there are so many thoughtful people out here um, who could also contribute to this. So I'd love if there were a forum for them to respond as well. But I'll just share these ideas off the top of my head. So in terms of commercial con third party commercial content moderators, I think it goes back to that third principle of the tech framework beyond the statement that I mentioned, which is treat workers who perform essential business functions as employees. Now, even within the contractor subcontractor relationship, there is a way to do that. That is providing mental health benefits or paying for that through the contract, making sure that's a part of the contract, um, putting limits on uh, time spent exposed to especially um, traumatic uh, trauma inducing content and harmful content. Um, and, you know, part of the reason why uh, these labor considerations are so important is because a lot of contracted third party content moderators are more likely than full time content moderators and trust and safety officers uh, to be people of color and to be immigrants or third parties. A lot of these third party company, uh, third party companies that are contracted by you know, US based tech companies are in other countries such as the Philippines, um, Poland um, and other countries where sometimes uh, the laxities in labor law are used within those home countries are used to undermine uh, the benefits, pay and services provided to these contractors. And so one, uh, one idea there is additionally, you know, parity in terms of um, applying the, 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 the standard that is higher of uh, whichever country to these contracts. Um, and then uh, finally, I think uh, another idea is, is looking back at these emerging trust and safety and content moderation, um, multi-stakeholder parties and think tanks and uh, organiza standard setting organizations that are emerging and sharing best practices, sharing pain points and challenges with those groups and building solidarity together um, in terms of developing, um, developing processes and protocols that will uh, prioritize the needs of these content moder moderators who, excuse me, who serve these really important functions. Um, and then of course, there's, there's always labor organizing beyond that, which I also ask that folks look into. There are options there. Um, in terms of a digital regulator agency, um, I do think in the, the provision in the Algorithmic Accountability Act is a good start in adding, I believe it was 50 staff um, and increased budget to create this Bureau of Technology to address resourcing needs. Um, but, you know, uh, putting, standing up a department is hard. Um, and so I think that's a great first step. Um, and I do think uh, eventually we will need to evolve to meet the times in terms of our government agencies. And if, if uh, digital regulation is not embedded in relevant agencies, then um, I would be inclined to, to create it, its own. And in terms of specific moderation incidents, I think um, it depends on uh, scale of impact and, and influence 
uh, but but not necessarily to the level per se of say like a Facebook oversight board and looking at individual content moderation decisions. And then uh, one, one last on reconciling tension between wanting transparency and preserving privacy. Absolutely. So um, this is a great question um, in that privacy is something that is rising in terms of public consciousness. It, we're starting to see the impacts of lack uh, regulation in the space, um, and yet there is not too much movement beyond, um, I think, Representative uh, Republican Leader for the House Energy and Commerce Committee, Kathy McMorris Rogers, and then the Consumer Protection and Commerce Subcommittee, uh, Republican Leader Gus Bilraki is issuing a statement on comprehensive national, national privacy legislation to create a national privacy standard. So it'll be interesting to follow that. Um, and it is, you know, I think a really important start and builds on like years of attempting to put a federal privacy standard together. Um, but all that's to say, uh, you know, that is something that we do need to address. But I think what's interesting and I think something important to disentangle here is that um, there is a way to absolutely self separate functions of a company from their user inputs and the user content. Um, so, you know, uh, that this is, this is kind of about trans transparency into the infrastructure as opposed to um, sharing of personal information. Um, and so I do think there's a way to reconcile uh, these goals. And I think, you know, the legislation that's out there, a lot of uh, the emerging auditing techniques that are coming out and a lot of the suggestions that have been given by civil rights organizations, disability rights advocates, um, privacy rights advocates for so long have has, have managed to disentangle this um, in a lot of thoughtful ways. So there, I think, is a lot of commentary and research in, in how to do that. Thanks so much, uh, Erica. Probably um, we have three minutes, so I'm trying to see. Um, yeah, just one last question. There is a question on, is there, how do you see global partnerships uh, in order to address hate speech around the world? Do, do you think this could be one solution in terms of inclusivity? Absolutely, I think, um, you know, uh, Europe has been a little more proactive in a sense in moving forward, uh, sweeping legislation and standing up um, agencies and department to, to deal with tech regulation and has been a bit faster on that than us. And, it, and of course, it has then informed um, U.S. policy. So if it can do so at the legislative and policy level, it absolutely must and oftentimes does already uh, through multi-stakeholder um, uh, partnerships and, and conversation. And so, um, you know, I think the situations we're facing here in the U.S. in terms of content moderation issues are situations that are faced by users all over the world and people all over the world. So um, in terms of a, a specific model, I, I don't necessarily have that, but um, I don't think current resourcing for content moderation is adequate. And um, I think that that comes to companies prioritizing this. Eventually, government legislation will step in, and provide some of that resourcing as well. Um, and, and companies bringing in grassroots stakeholders, like individual users who have had adverse experiences and, and have been harmed on these platforms to inform these builds. And then also bringing in civil rights and academia, um, you know, civil society, um, not just to, to court them with donations, but, all, but also to like really um, work with them on creating these policies before they're deployed as opposed to fixing them. That's the perfect work to end uh, this conversation. Thank you very much, Erica. And, uh, and thanks to you all for joining us today. And of course, thank you to the Program on Democracy and the Internet team for uh, helping us um, having a smooth uh, conversation. So please join us uh, for another uh, webinar. There are many, as you can see, uh, for this uh, winter seminar, uh, sorry, winter semester. Um, next week, February the 1st, will be about algorithmic news feeds and elections featuring Alessandro Vecchiato, sorry, Program on Democracy and the Internet. And you can sign up through the link that was just posted in the in the chat. Thank you very much for joining and we wish you a wonderful rest of your day, night.